welcome to our webinar at home with Sorbonne University Abu Dhabi. Today we have the pleasure to welcome senior members of La Sorbonne, the University Vice Chancellor Sylvia Serrano, the Head of Archaeology and History Caroline Autre, and the Director of the Lab Laboratory of Molecular and Structural Archaeology Philippe Walter. We are very honored to organize this event with La Sorbonne Abu Dhabi, which is a major actor in the UAE artistic and cultural scenes, not only through their academic contribution, but also through the numerous events they organize. We are also very pleased, as we have in the team of the Art Circle, Asma Sadek, who is a friend of La Sorbonne. The subject of today is very wide, but we have with us real experts who will help us to better understand this very interesting topic when science meets arts. To introduce our speakers, we have with us as moderator, Vincent Larnicol, art collector and contributor to the Art Circle. Before starting, I have a few administrative matters. First of all, we have put you all on mute, so please remain muted during the whole presentation. And may I ask you to address your question by uh, writing them on the chat function. Vincent will ask them for us at the end of the presentation. Sylvia, Caroline, Philippe, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, so we're here for something rather exciting. I, we have Caroline today. Uh, I think, Caroline, I'm not sure we can see you very well because obviously there's so many people on the screen. So if you can just wave your hand. Yes, this is uh, Caroline Autre and Philippe Walter. Uh, also Philippe with a lot of books behind him, obviously, uh, as, as of course a professor should be. Um, we have a very interesting subject in the sense that we're merging science and art. And I think we're all, for art lovers, there are many, many reasons uh, where science in fact should intervene. And, and today we are going to have examples of fascinating uh, uh, aspects and applications of science in art. We will start with, uh, with you, Caroline. You are an archeologist uh, by trade, obviously running the archeology span program for, uh, for La Sorbonne. And I know I have seen your presentation or very briefly your presentation. And I think you've got some really exciting stuff uh, to show us today. So I will, I will give you the floor and, and thanking you again, both of you for, uh, for attending today. I will um, take over after probably 15, 20 minutes, uh, Caroline, if you don't mind, uh, and introduce Philippe uh, with his, uh, maybe a little bit more technology uh, approach even to, uh, to art as you're doing, Caroline. So the floor is yours, Caroline, go ahead. Thank you, Vincent. Um, so let me, uh, oops, let's save the first slide. Here we go. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I will be speaking about uh, art and uh, science. I purposely uh, reverse uh, the title, or since I am an archeologist, mostly about so the practice of archaeology and in general heritage and uh, sciences. So me, I will be speaking uh, more about artifacts than artworks. Uh, Philip uh, Walter will be uh, talking more about artworks. And I wanted to introduce you uh, the relation, uh, relationship between uh, science and heritage or archaeology. We are now uh, working on a master in archaeology and cultural heritage that uh, we hope that will be, um, for this master, we will be collaborating uh, closely, hopefully, with the Department of Science. So uh, you will see that uh, the two are uh, closely linked. So in the last two decades, uh, scientific methods have been more and more applied uh, to the study of uh, humanities in general, and it has a significant impact on heritage. It uh, simply revolutionized in the practice of uh, archeology. span So during uh, field work, and also during what we called in French post fouille. So post fouille is uh, everything that we do after the field work. So uh, when we are working on the artifacts, uh, the data collected uh, at the site, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just so you know, archeological field work is actually just the tip of the iceberg. Most of the work that uh, we do will be done after actually uh, the field work. It's it will be conducted afterwards. So why is uh, science so important and how is it relevant 
to uh, archaeological practice and the study and uh, preservation of heritage. So in order to explain you um, the scientific methods, some of them that we employed in, uh, in the field of archaeology and cultural heritage, <clears throat> I will introduce you some uh, of the step of archaeological uh, research. I don't have time to uh, develop. So from the discovery of the sites and the artifacts to the study uh, of uh, this cultural heritage. So I selected a few examples. But first of all, I should stress that uh, archaeology is also a science. It is considered uh, as a science, perhaps because uh, scientific method has have always been uh, used uh, in this field uh, of research and science has been uh, used uh, almost forever uh, to conduct research in archaeology well at least since archaeology is considered as a science because you might know that it was not always uh, the case of course so uh, for instance aerial photography was used uh, for survey uh, for surveying sites from uh, 1920, uh, so that's very early after uh, the beginning of uh, photography. Uh, and another example uh, that is more relevant to us today is that after World War II, we see an incredible um, progress of uh, scientific methods uh, that were developed actually initially for the purpose of uh, geology that we will start to apply in archaeology. So here again, first uh, for the purpose of uh, finding sites, uh, but both on land and underwater. So we are using a lot of uh, geophysics and geochemical uh, survey. So these methods were linked uh, to geology simply because they are linked to the subsoil resources. They were initially uh, developed to look for the presence of ore and for mining industry. So one of these methods that I will introduce today is uh, the uh, geophysics uh, methods. So it is electric uh, survey. Uh, I took this one because it's the most ancient uh, scientific method that is applied to uh, archaeology. So how does it work is uh, that we measure very briefly, we measure electrical uh, resistivity. So basically how uh, the difficulty, uh, how hard um, the current will go through a given volume of soil. So uh, as I wrote you, it's the contrary of conductivity, which is how easy the current will go through uh, the soil, which is another method that uh, can be used, but uh, with different uh, devices. And so it uh, belongs to another category. So anyway, um, so these me methods, as you can see, um, use, uh, I put you an example of a device, uh, there are many devices, but in general, the devices are quite uh, easy um, to uh, use and they give um, <coughs> a very, let's say, quite easy, uh, the anomalies are quite easy to interpret, as uh, you can see. Here, so that's really the advantages of conducting electric uh, survey. So just so you know, for instance, uh, a soil that is uh, made of stones, uh, stones in run artifacts uh, or dry soil uh, are very resistant. So that's what you can see here, while on the contrary, humid uh, soil or, and the clay uh, artifact or clay uh, structures are, um, have a very low resistance and they are very uh, conductive uh, for the current. It helps the current uh, to go through. So you can see that this uh, provided, this is an example of a theater and then this, the team superposed uh, the find they had uh, during um, the excavation. So you can see that indeed uh, what has a, a very uh, high resistivity is where you can find uh, the structure of the theater. So uh, the high resistivity here in this case indicates the build structure, so where we have the stones uh, preserved. So uh, this one is uh, quite easily, but as you can imagine, other methods are uh, much more complicated. So uh, 
to do it because the devices will be much more complicated, they need calibration, etc. And also, as you can see, because the results uh, would need to be interpreted by a specialist. So in this case, it is, of course, uh, some uh, scientists that will do um, the survey and not really uh, the archaeologists. And we need to collaborate uh, because we cannot interpret the results. I mean, you will see it doesn't, uh, once you have the interpretation, it's not that difficult, but if you have only uh, the, the first map uh, without a specialist, you cannot interpret uh, what you have found. So the major interest uh, of using um, this kind of method, so um, scientific methods, is that uh, it is uh, what Philip, will, Philip Walter will say also will emphasize, I'm sure, that it is non-destructive. Um, why uh, am I uh, saying this? It's because it's the exact opposite of the process of archaeology, which is uh, destructive. Uh, you archaeologists, uh, we uh, destroy the data uh, as we are uh, co collecting them, basically. Um, so we need, I, uh, it's of the utmost importance to record all the data that we find, uh, the artifact, but also data uh, of uh, the site, because uh, as I told you, as we are digging, we are basically destroying the site and we cannot go back. So we need uh, as much data uh, to be able to work uh, afterwards. So uh, to record uh, what we find, we use, of course, uh, several methods. So we can use a GPS to have the exact, uh, to record the exact location and sometimes to uh, measure, to do some measurements. Of course, drawings, we draw by hand and then we ink uh, the drawings with the assistance of computers. We can use photography and uh, a very uh, specific technique linked to, oops, sorry, photography that is called photogrammetry. So nowadays, photogrammetry is commonly employed during archaeological uh, field work. And it is uh, exactly in the topic of today when art meets uh, science, because it consists of extracting 3D data from uh, simple pictures. So you will obtain, uh, as you can see here, a kind of a 3D scan from multiple shots. So uh, this process is used to uh, record, measure, and also interpret uh, some uh, the, the sites or also the artifact, as uh, you can see with the skeleton. So the principle, uh, so photogrammetry is based on stereoscopy. So basically like uh, our eyes, uh, you need a two vision of uh, what you are looking. So basically uh, it consists in superposing uh, the images that are taken of uh, something uh, similar, taken with different angles. And uh, with this process of stereoscopy, these different angles, so from something flat, you will be able to create a uh, relief. So the pictures can be taken from uh, the ground or uh, from uh, above, so from a plane or uh, nowadays from a drone also. So it can be used uh, photogrammetry for uh, big uh, surfaces, so a site and even bigger, uh, even bigger surfaces. So just so you know, when you put a 3D view on Google Earth, uh, the buildings that you can see, they rely on this process and actually relies on photogrammetry. But they can also be used, uh, be used as you can see, uh, it is employed for uh, artifacts uh, and it is very precious. For instance, when digging, you can see here a skeleton. So this is a different uh, stage uh, of uh, digging. So when you record like this, you are sure that uh, you will not miss any information during the process of uh, excavating. So once you have uh, multiple uh, pictures, so just so you know, this is from a site I'm working in uh, Pompeii. So that's, you can see that's the drawing. Uh, I don't know if you're able to see that it's exactly the same site. So this structure can find, uh, sorry. <laughs> this structure can be found here, this one here, just that here we were a bit more advanced in the digging than uh, what the drawing is showing. But to do uh, this photogrammetry, uh, we took more than 500 pictures. 
Okay, so <clears throat> once you have these multiple pictures, uh, we use, of course, a software with algorithm, uh, which will correlate and merge all these images together to provide an infinite uh, this view in volume, so this uh, 3D uh, view. So we can also use uh, this technique of multiple uh, pictures to uh, get uh, 3D uh, images underwater. And it is uh, then called um, photo mosaic. Don't ask me why it's a different name, but that's how it is. Um, so photo mosaic uh, reflects, in my opinion, uh, more what it is about that we create an image based on a mosaic, uh, mosaic of uh, pictures. But as you can see, it is the same. Uh, we obtain a 3D uh, view and uh, incredible views of uh, deep sea finds. So here it is a cargo a shipwreck uh, from the 4th century BC found in Cyprus, the Mazotos shipwrecks. Uh, it lies uh, by 55 meters uh, underwater. And you can see that the cargo, the amphorae that were uh, the cargo can show here exactly um, the shape of uh, the boat as it was before. So uh, I will not take more time, um, but um, so I will just before to uh, give to let Philip um, talk because he will talk more about art artworks. I just wanted to uh, show you some other uh, science uh, methods, techniques that are applied uh, to archaeology and uh, material culture. And instead of, I decided that instead of uh, telling you more about it, uh, it would be more relevant, uh, more meaningful to show you uh, some uh, short extract, very short extract of some videos that um, I will uh, provide you. Uh, you can find them online, so I will provide you uh, the link to them afterwards. So um, I'll explain to you uh, quickly when they start. So uh, the process here is basically it's, uh, forensics, just so you know, uh, kind of forensics methods uh, that you will see here that was developed by a French team uh, to study cultural uh, heritage and archeological artifacts. Uh, so they will first, as you will see, scan uh, the artifact. So here it is a fardo, so it is a funerary bundle that uh, was found in, uh, that is found in Peru. Then they map the scan they will do with the original uh, fardo. They will superpose the two images, the scan and the real one, uh, with uh, the real one that uh, was processed with, here again, photogrammetry. And um, afterwards, using mixed reality glasses and uh, mixed reality, so it's uh, at the same time augmented and uh, virtual reality, they will create an interactive hologram uh, that is calculated every millisecond, just to give you an idea. So they will, they are able with this to study the artifact live. So here you see they are at the hospital, they are scanning uh, with an MRI uh, the fardo. Um, so I'll show you a bit there and then uh, I'll move forward, uh, but you can have the link uh, to see the whole documentary after that. So uh, let me move. Okay. Uh, okay, not good. Yeah. <laughs> So here, once they put the glass, here is what they see. So you see the photo is here, but what you're seeing is shown in the screen. So I'm moving a bit forward. So that's everything that is uh, inside. You will understand. Um, just the end. So you see, so that's uh, here. You can see that's a fabric and then they can play uh, on the density of the object. 
So if they want to see the fabric here, you can see the play playing on the density, they will see uh, the bones. So you can see here the crane and I will move a bit forward again. So uh, a bit too forward. So here the crane uh, and uh, if they want uh, stuff that are even more dense, they will have only uh, a stone and uh, here uh, the teeth. So I'll go to uh, another one uh, afterwards. So you see that's, uh, that comes from everything, uh, I mean, from uh, the scanning of the object. I have uh, just a quick other one. So that's a crane, that was fine. And you see, so they did the same. Um, they uh, did an MRI and they uh, then used photogrammetry. Uh, and virtual reality, uh, maybe I could move a bit forward. So um, this is again what they see, though as you understood, the object is not uh, of course in front of them. They can still uh, study it. So you see the, in the same, the play on density. So if they want to have the flesh or only the bones, and uh, I'm leaving it because they can even see, you see, uh, that's uh, part of uh, what is conserved, what is preserved of uh, the brain inside uh, the crane. So uh, it gives really uh, incredible uh, results and incredible, of course, possibilities in terms of, uh, in terms of research and study what would be, if not completely uh, impossible, because of course, you will not break the crane uh, to get inside. Or the fado, you will not open the fado uh, to uh, get uh, inside. And at the end, just to finish uh, on that, so uh, so here the same. He has the uh, virtual reality uh, glasses. He's studying. He's an anthropologist, so he will uh, studying um, the crane. So he's detecting diseases, uh, etc. Thanks to this technology, and then. Uh, They can uh, also use uh, all this work to, of course, what uh, we are seeing here, uh, to recreate um, the person uh, to whom the crane belongs. So uh, this is a female uh, person. And they found out actually that this, uh, her face, except that she has a malformation on the top of the crane, but except from that, her face is, is still very similar to the Nakas uh, people living in the Nakas area where the crane was found uh, at the time. If I may, Caroline, uh, with, with, with videos like this, you are going to uh, uh, excite a lot of the young audience that we have uh, today. <laughs> this is, this is going to bring a lot of vocations. This is quite... <laughs> Striking, I must say. Uh, this is a, this is a new a new world. I mean, I just watched the dig on Netflix, and we, we are so far away from that story. Yeah. Uh, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing, Calvin. So it was just to show. So uh, I'm done. So just a few words on these videos is that uh, the advantage, of course, as you might understand, of the process is that though the person might not be physically here, they can still uh, run their study. And this would enable, of course, a team of specialists uh, to analyze simultaneously uh, the same artifact while being uh, in different places. And uh, yeah, the, of course, the video uh, where to see because a lot of young people now want to do forensics and you can do forensics not only uh, to solve murder, but uh, beyond that uh, for uh, scientific purposes. Uh, and I'm uh, finishing, I will uh, give you uh, the floor in two seconds, uh, Vincent. Uh, this uh, presentation of uh, when art uh, meets science, nowadays that's what happened, with a picture to show you that in antiquity art was uh, science. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Merci, Philippe, Caroline. Uh, thank you so much for this. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for this very exciting and inspiring uh, video, actually, with your technology, with, with obviously the, the job that you are doing with obviously worldwide colleagues. So extremely exciting. I know that Philippe has even more uh, to show us uh, with extremely advanced technologies that are uh, on the way to be implemented or maybe already implemented or at least under development, uh, particularly um, applied to uh, art, artwork, let's say. So, Philippe, I, I'll, I'll leave you to it, and I'm sure I'm gonna, I, I already see quite a lot of questions coming in, so uh, 
I'll summarize at the very end. The floor is yours, uh, Philippe. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, Vincent. So I would like to just uh, just uh, before starting, I would like to, to show you different examples of the application of scientific analysis to the study of artworks. And uh, my research is mainly dedicated to paintings. So I will show you personal examples on, on different kinds of paintings. So to start, I just would like to emphasize the fact that this uh, use of scientific methods to study works of art is not new. So some of them are very well known today and are playing a major role actually in the domain of authentication of works of art. So here it is a scientific image of the Mona Lisa under UV. It is a very simple method with a UV lamp. You can buy one for $20 and you can observe immediately at the surface of, of the painting that we are, you have dark areas. And these dark areas are corresponding to restoration on the Mona Lisa painting. So immediately with such kind of things, you have a first insight about the state of preservation. And we can continue. And since the discovery of X-rays at the end of the 19th century, people uh, try to carry out some X-ray, X-ray radiography of the painting. And again, on Mona Lisa, you can see uh, the, the radiography and you can observe. And at the end, I will discuss uh, more at this point, you can see that, for example, the face of Mona Lisa is not appearing very well in, uh, in, under X-rays because Leonardo da Vinci used very thin layers of paint matters to realize the portrait. So it is ancient techniques that are used in many, many places and actually, but uh, since the last, uh, I would say, 20 years, people have also developed other kinds of technologies, what we uh, are describing actually as non-destructive testing techniques. That mean a wide group of scientific methods, physical and chemical methods that can be used in all the domain of our life, in science, in industry, in forensic, to evaluate the properties, the nature of the properties of a simple material or of very complex materials. So in, in my personal research, I started to develop such kind of techniques in 1997, when the NASA sent a rover on Mars to make analysis of the, the rocks on the Mars planet. I just would like to emphasize that in just two weeks, we'll have a new rover on Mars, and uh, probably you will have a lot of information about the new technologies that are been developed also to study the rocks and possible traces of life on the planet Mars. But from this, uh, from these technologies for space, uh, people, industry has developed commercial devices, for example, to analyze ceramics with such kind of, uh, of gun with X-rays, it is called X-ray fluorescence. And in only few seconds or few minutes, you can have a good identification of the nature of the, of the materials that were used, and you can find some trace elements, for example, that can give insights on the trade of materials during the Greek period, uh, considering this, this veil, this whole point. But also another domain, and it is my domain, is to develop, to build new prototypes. And because of the link with NASA, I would like to, to show you a first, a first example of a prototype that I developed with colleagues uh, from NASA, it is again with x-rays to analyze directly a painting and not only to have the chemical composition of one area of the painting by doing what we call single spot analysis that means we are choosing the place where we want to do the analysis with the colleagues we develop a camera a camera with x-rays and with this camera it is possible to have the chemical composition on each point of this painting from Gustave Caillebotte so our project uh, was developed just before NASA sent the, the new rover to, to Mars. It was not selected for, for the next mission, but we hope that it will be selected for missions on other in the, in the close future. So on this case on, on Caillebotte, so Gustave Caillebotte, an impressionist painter, it is, it is a beautiful painting showing his, uh, his family in his houses, North Paris. And we did the chemical map on the face of his mother, as you can see there. We need only a few hours to do this chemical map. And if I look just on one tile here on the flowers with green and red color, 
we obtain what we call the chemical map. So it doesn't matter, you have the chemical element there. What is extremely important is that with this technique, we are able to identify each pigment to understand the nature of the different mixtures Kaibot used to produce the colors. And also on such kind of diagrams there, we were able to demonstrate that we have some information about the impurities that are in the pigments used by Gustave Kaibot. So we can say, for example, with this painting, that we know he used a blue pigment made with cobalt. Cobalt is a metal that was used to produce blue pigment during the 19th, since the 19th century. And in this blue pigment, we can know exactly the quantity of impurity in iron and nickel, so two other elements. So it is just a fact. It is just interesting as a fact. But it is also interesting because it is a description, a very accurate description, about the nature of the pigments used by Kaibot from his dealer of colors. So it can be useful in the future, for example, uh, for the authentication of a painting of Kaibot. If it is from the same period, we must have the same impurities. So you can see with this technique, we have not a deep information about the practices, uh, the artistic practices for the creation of the works of art, but we have also information about impurities and then it can be useful for authentication. For the practices of the artist, you can see just the mouth of his mother, you can see the complexity of the colors and you can see the list of pigments we have recognized. And for example, you have here two vermilion colors Red vermilion is very well known, but Kaibot used also an orange vermilion, which was a pigment developed at this period for the artist. And on the mark, we have both red and orange vermilion colors. So that means with the same composition, but because the preparation of the pigment were not the same, the pigments have not the same colors. So it is interesting to see that the list is relatively short, but with some aspect that can be characteristic of the practices of this painter. So we develop in the lab many, many techniques and we are working uh, worldwide. Uh, you can see different examples. So uh, just before Caroline discussed about uh, Peru, so it is measurements that we carried out on the red colors on the Temple of the Sun in Pachacamac, south of, of Lima, but we are working also on rock art paintings here in the Chauvet Cave in France with the oldest paintings. You can see here a mammoth with, uh, with uh, the, the body of the mammoth there, uh, Caibot, Bruegel, and, and many other cases. My, my first example is uh, on, uh, of application is in Egypt because we have a very important program in Egypt in close cooperation with the Ministry of Antiquity of, of Egypt, so in Luxor, and we are working with our mobile instruments with non-destructive testing, that means with techniques that are allowing chemical analysis and studies of the paintings without any damage for them. And we are working in the desert to go to the tombs. So you have a lot of tombs in, in Luxor. This is a 3D model of one of those we have analyzed because we are also trying to record at a very high resolution 3D model of these tombs. So it is like if you are in the rock of the mountain and you can see the different parts of, of this tomb and we are working usually three in the same place because you can see it is very small uh, monuments so size is uh, something like 10 meters uh, 10 meters long that we are doing simultaneously 3d modeling like caroline explained before microscopy optical microscopy with uv with infrared with normal light also to understand the, the, the pigments the nature of the grains and also chemical imaging with different techniques. So this picture is just a 360 degree image of our activities in the tomb. So usually we are, uh, it is necessary to have three days to record a lot of data in one tomb. And actually in our project, which is stopped this year due, due to the COVID-19 uh, disease, uh, but we hope to continue next year, uh, we actually, we have analyzed, studied, recorded about 20 different tombs from the period of the 16th and the 19th and 20th dynasty in Egypt. That means from the period of uh, Tutankhamun, Ramses II, Ramses III, and so on. This is one example of, of application. This is one of the, of the paintings in the tomb I, I, shown, I have shown, and it is a representation of the King Ramses II. 
So you can see the face. It is a beautiful uh, painting from, from ancient Egypt. But when we are looking in detail, thanks to our chemical studies, we can do what we call a chemical map. So that means that we scan like on Kaibot, but here it is on a larger surface. So we scan our instrument to record the chemical distribution of the elements that are characteristic to the pigment. So here I can display copper, arsenic, and iron. Copper is characteristic of blue, arsenic is characteristic of yellow or orange, and iron is characteristic of red. So you can see in false color, so in blue, you have copper, arsenic in, in uh, green, and iron in red. And you can see different distribution that are not exactly similar to what you can see with our eyes. And in particular, you can see here that the shape that we have underlined with the green line of uh, the, the scepter is not exactly the shape that you can see here on, on the picture. So we can make different drawings with this kind of things, with iron and also copper and arsenic. And we can compare the chemical analysis we have obtained, the image through the chemical analysis we, we obtain with reference database of images, for example, of the crown of the pharaoh. And we can see that we have many, many differences. And that means that we can observe that the painter started to uh, realize the painting, oops, sorry, started to realize the painting with the crown, which was larger, and scratch a part. But when the crown was larger, he put a necklace, which has not the same shape as today. So that means the necklace was painted over by a new necklace with another name, another technology. So one is uh, Wedek and the other is Shibiu. And when he did that, he obtained some difficulties because you have some superimposition between the scepter and the face. So he has also to modify the face. So that means at the end of this story that we observe two steps of realization of this painting, meaning that the artist changed his ideas and at the beginning produced one image and then totally changed this image to make another image with another shape of crone with another necklace and with another place for the scepter. So all the attributes of the pharaoh. So it is something amazing and very important for us because it is, to our knowledge, the first case when we can see such kind of repaint, such kind of modification of the composition. And this kind of modification of the composition are very well known for the modern painting since the, the Renaissance period when we, you have painters working on the paintings and modeling, remodeling the paintings, sometimes several times. So we try to understand that, and this is why actually we are increasing the number of, of tombs that we are analyzing to be able to, to understand if this uh, phenomenon uh, is only on this place or if it was something used frequently by the ancient Egyptian artists. So another kind of application is also to, to work with such kind of instruments. It was one week ago in Normandy, in Bayeux, uh, in France, we worked on the Bayeux tapestry. The Bayeux tapestry is a very large uh, cloth, embroid un un embroidered cloth, uh, depicting the Norman conquest of England. So it is dated from the beginning of the 12th century. And with Another kind of technique, which is called hyperspectral imaging, we were able to record the 70 meters of this tapestry with a very high resolution. And that means just in two weeks, we were able to record 1 billion of spectra. And that means that we have today the recording of the chemical nature of the dyes on each thread of the tapestry. So at the end, it's just the beginning of our process. Huh? Uh, I show you just the very recent research. We were able to, to map the different colors. And it is important for different points of view. The first point of view, it is important for conservation, to know how is preserved our cultural heritage objects, artifacts. Because we have here a recording which is very precise and that can be reproduced in the future. So that means in 100 years, for example, people can reproduce and compare the results with our results 
to see if we have the fading of the colors. That means that the colors were degraded or, or not. But also we are able to map all the colors. And for example, here on the horse, you can see that we have a pink color in the middle of the red. It was because one part of, of this, uh, this part of the tapestry was restored during the 19th century with other dyes. So actually we try also to search for uh, an identification of the original components and the identification of the restorations of, of the uh, tapestry through times. So just to finish, because uh, time is running, uh, again on, on Leonardo da Vinci. So it is not new, it is studies that we carried out uh, 15 years ago, 15 to 10 years ago on, on the Mona Lisa. So to show you that these techniques are new, but relatively new. So 15 years ago, we were able to move the Mona Lisa from the showcase to the exhibition room and to do analysis again with X-rays. And so we demonstrate a lot of things, things to, thanks to this analysis, but also we open the way to uh, new possibilities with these non-destructive techniques. That, the, that means possibilities not only to identify the pigments, the impurities on, on the pigments, but also to have a deep insight about the superimposition of layers by the artist. When we are looking to paintings from the Renaissance period, for example, for, for Leonardo, Raphael, and, and others, it is very important to consider that the work of the painter was to superimpose different layers with different thicknesses, different conditions. And thanks to that, we are able to make what we call a virtual cross-section. So this, this uh, diagram is similar to a cut of the, of the Mona Lisa along this line. And you can see the thicknesses of the different layers, the varnish and the dark glaze, which is used for the shadows, and also the pink and the priming layer uh, underneath. So that means that on the face of Mona Lisa, the wall thickness of the pigments is less than 100 micrometers. So that means that the layers are very thin and we were able also to identify the composition. But thanks to that, we, are also, we were also able to demonstrate that Leonardo da Vinci was able to spread layers as thin as one or two micrometers thick. So that means incredibly thick layer. And one part of the fascination to this painting is due to the fact that we can observe no brush strokes no trace of the realization by the artist, but it is mainly due to the fact that it was able, what he, it was able to superimpose very thin layers that are not visible by naked eyes. So it is also interesting because you can imagine the, the complexity of such kind of technique. So first to spread a white layer, then a pink layer, and then a lot of very thin layer of dark matter, and uh, it must take time. And we know that it was a very long process for Leonardo because during the 16th century, you have another artist, also writers, who wrote about the Mona Lisa that Leonardo worked on it uh, for four years. And it was probably due to this very uh, complex technique with a superimposition of a lot of layers. And Vasari said also he left it unfinished, so I don't know why. He left it unfinished, but it is another topic of discussion for the art historian. So just to, to finish uh, what this one. And to summary, what we can do today with this kind of non-destructive technique, it is the idea that we can work on the history of techniques, the history of pigments, to know the list of pigments used by an artist at a specific period. We can find relevant impurities to follow the trade of pigments and exchange of materials, sometimes uh, with very long distances. We can also understand the artist's gesture, so how he spreads uh, mater materials, paint matter, and uh, what the thickness of the layer was. So with these three aspects, we can describe exactly what happened in the workshop of the artist, the whole process of the creation of, of the painting. But we have also a lot of information about the degradation of the color through times. So it is also very important for conservation and restoration purposes. So here you have two examples of two versions of the sunflowers by, by Van Gogh. And you can see that the yellow color was strongly modified. It was strongly modified due to the alteration with light. And all these aspects today are, all, are also contributing 
I think a lot, not enough today, but uh, in the future, I hope more for the attribution, authentication, and traceability of the works of art. And it is something important because it was not used generally uh, 10 years ago. It was used only in the main museums in the world. But today we observe, for example, in auction, that some um, of the main companies of auction have created recently laboratory of non-destructive testing and chemical analysis to try to use these techniques uh, to contribute uh, to the attribution or authentication of the works of art. So I have finished. So as usual, uh, I need to put uh, all the sponsors of such kind of, of application. And I'd like to show this, this painting from Martin von Heimschreck, so from the 16th century, showing uh, Saint-Luc painting the Virgin in his own workshop. And you can see the beautiful palette he has in his hands and uh, with a lot of brushes. And you can see the complexity of the different materials. And Daniel Arras, a great uh, French art historian, wrote a very nice text about the, this palette, because maybe you can see on the picture there that we have a small drop of a liquid, which is translucent, and which seems to be very important for the artist at the center of this palette. And probably because it was modified, the properties of the different colors around, and it was necessary before painting the face of the Virgin. So thank you very much for your attention. Caroline, thank, thank you so much. <clears throat> I think you have answered a lot of the questions actually that were raised, but there's one thing that actually strikes me is how in fact those technologies are accessible to great number of people. In fact, I mean, you are using instruments that are almost democratic, I would say. Do you feel that uh, thanks to these technologies that are very accessible now more and more, that you will have a lot more uh, archaeologists and art experts coming into the field? Do you feel that there is a connection to uh, more students and the younger generation to your field, which, let's face it, probably 20, 30 years ago was maybe a, a bit of an obscure uh, world. Do you feel the appeal of your job uh, to, to the younger generation, since you are, of course, in connection with students in your, in your work? And that, that, that's a, a question for both Caroline and yourself, uh, Philippe. Okay, if I'm starting, uh, I think there is a growing interest of, the, of this technique. So in art history, if we want to convince uh, everybody, uh, we need to, to start with the students and with a professor of art history. So it is something interesting to see that uh, actually the interest of the art historians to use this kind of techniques for their uh, own research is growing. And I have today, yes, today, this afternoon, a meeting to share a PhD student with an art historian about the Renaissance period. So actually it is something that uh, it is possible. In the past, all these techniques were more, were considered more dedicated to conservation purposes, to help the restorer more than the, uh, the art historian or for the authentication of the work of art. But uh, actually there, were, there is a growing interest and we need to teach that, we need to explain that. These instruments are not very costly, so that means it is possible to develop private companies and not only in universities, laboratories, but also private companies to help uh, the, the, the people uh, that want to know more about their, their works of art. And, and Caroline, as far as archaeology, do you see more appeal into archaeology thanks to technology in a way? Kind of, instead of being interested in archaeology, history and so on, people who are very techno-driven now want to use it for archaeology and, 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 and in a way becoming little Sherlock Holmes of, uh, and, and using archaeology as a field of, uh, of, of interest through technology? Um, yes, actually there are uh, people that um, they can start the same uh, that uh, the students is the first uh, step that could be interested in archaeology but um, we've seen some students who are like uh, passionate, uh, we call them nerds, let's say, uh, passionate about uh, IT or about sciences, 
and that uh, eventually they move to uh, to this uh, to be able to um, to study archaeology through uh, sciences or through uh, computer science. I mean, yes, that's uh, something that can drive the, the student. I mean, motivate uh, them, and we need that because. Uh, we need to evolve uh, with our time and as uh, you've seen that um, sciences and um, in general are very helpful uh, when it comes to the study uh, of um, of material culture uh, in general whether it's paintings or uh, archaeological artifacts so i think it is important to let the student know that there is uh, this possibility also for them yes and do you see, this is another question we had, it's kind of the reverse question is, do you feel that there is an influence from art into science, from artists into scientists? Do you feel that there is, it's a back and forth relationship between the two of you? I would say, does Ecole des Beaux-Arts influence uh, La Sorbonne uh, scientists in a way, and art historians? Do you, do you see that connection between the, the different arrondissements of Paris? Mm -hmm. I would love to, 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 to be during the 19th century. And then I can say immediately, yes, a lot. During the 19th century, you have people in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Paris uh, that were chemists, teaching science for artists. For example, Louis Pasteur was teacher of chemistry and physics for the new artists at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. So it was something uh, totally... Uh, Evident, it was, it was normal for, for, for these people. In my lab, I, I'd like to say also that we are working on paintings and painters before the beginning of the 20th century. The, the problem for the 20th century is that for the artists, they obtain many, many new materials, a lot of new materials with new effects. And then they started to do a lot of things that has, that has no sense for, for chemists or for physicists. So they try to, to create sometimes with the wrong way and then we have a destruction of, of the work of art, sometimes in a good way and uh, everybody is happy. But I think it is something totally, uh, totally, the situation is totally different. But today, again, there is a growing interest about that. So for example, you, you remember maybe uh, the work that uh, Anish Kapoor started to work on a new pigment is the total black color. And it was a collaboration with an industry of nanotechnology. So that means that artists and industry of chemistry, physics, nanotechnology are starting to work again together. During the 16, during the 60s, Yves Klein also worked with his color seller uh, to produce the international Klein Blue. It was not very complex uh, at that time. It was not a development of technology, but the right choice of the binder with the right preparation of the pigment. So that means that sometimes you have such kind of things, but actually chemistry, physics, properties of painting are not teach in detail as it was during the 19th century for the artist, for the new artist. I, I am thinking of a, a, a fantastic exhibition that we had, I think, in Pompidou, on, oh no, it was maybe Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris on Kupka, who was talking, of course, of the uh, light spectrometry. And it was quite fascinating, his interpretation, like Delaunay, of course. So we have many examples in the art history of, of influence. And I, I do share what you're, what you're saying. Probably a last it's question, more, I, I guess. More the series. It is more on the series yes. in science, more than a close link between scientists and artists. Yes. But of course, artists like to, to follow the new theories. Yes. Last question, perhaps for you, Caroline. Do you feel that there are, thanks to science, do you feel that we are now speeding up the discovery, the world discovery of what is underground? Your work is, a lot of it requires, normally requires excavation, digging. Do you feel that we will, we will be learning a lot more thanks to science without actually digging and excavating? And will it speed up our understanding of, of history, of human history in a way? Well, um, I am not sure um, it will be possible to uh, do archaeological uh, study and research based only on um, science. I mean, for now, uh, for now at least, uh, because 
you can, uh, it is uh, science uh, really help in archaeology and is really kind of speeding uh, the process, uh, as you said, uh, especially when we have the artifact. I mean, now we can uh, have much more detailed uh, results that because as you can see uh, with the Fado, for instance, we can see inside. So it provides completely new perspective about what is archaeology and what is uh, studying uh, some artifacts. When it comes to site, um, I'm not sure because you can indeed study site, you can have, a, it's really helpful to find sites. So if you have an inch and uh, you can actually uh, detect, maybe have a better uh, understanding of what would be the site, but uh, excavating would still uh, be uh, necessary. Though sometimes depending on it depends what you want to do, what you want to achieve, what are your research question. Sometimes it's true that now they're using these techniques and then they just uh, do what we call in French sondage. So very short uh, excavation, uh, very small, excavation um, to uh, demonstrate that they're right without uh, really uh, opening everything that can happen. It depends basically of the time of the money of uh, a lot of things, but you still need to uh, excavate, I think. Well, thank, you very much. Th thank you very much, Caroline and Philippe. I think I can tell you that the comments uh, show the enormous excitement. I think you've blown away our audience, and uh, I personally want to thank you for being so, I would say, easy to understand. It's a complex subject, obviously, but in, uh, in less than one hour, you have managed to probably uh, uh, generate vocations to our young generation, but even myself, I'm now thinking of my retirement plan. Maybe I should be digging from now on. So maybe this is what I should be thinking about the next life. Barbara, the floor is yours to conclude, probably. Thank you so much, uh, Philippe and Caroline. Thank you. thank you, Vincent. Thank you. What a, an amazing subject. Uh, Caroline and Philippe, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. It's unbelievable to see what we are able to discover of our past. Uh, thanks to you, we better understand that there is definitely art in sciences and sciences in art. I will be very happy to share the program with our members. And also, Caroline, if you can send us the video that was uh, so interesting. I'm sure a lot of uh, our members would like to see that video too. On behalf of the Art Circle Board, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. Do not hesitate to follow our webpage and Instagram, theartcircle.ae, where you will find the replays of our webinars and general information about the Art Circle. Stay safe, stay tuned, and see you soon. Thank you, everyone.